Okay. Hi, everyone. Welcome to another episode of Science and Technology Q&A. Um, there, there have been requests multiple times for me to talk about LISP. So maybe I can do that a little bit. I'm not sure I am the biggest expert on the history of LISP. So LISP is uh, a programming language, list processing language, uh, originally invented by a chap called John McCarthy, who I did know somewhat, um, who uh, was a, well, when I knew him, I would say he was a somewhat curmudgeonly fellow um, with, uh, who worked at Stanford. He had, I think, previously been at MIT um, and as part of the sort of Marvin Minsky artificial intelligence effort, and then sort of splintered off to Stanford where he kind of um, launched, uh, I think, the early days of kind of uh, artificial intelligence um, at Stanford. Uh, he was interested, I think, in the mid 1950s in kind of, okay, we're gonna do artificial intelligence. I think he was involved in coining the name even. And uh, it's like, how are we gonna do artificial intelligence? We've got sort of models of neural networks. We've got at that time, finite automata models where like a switching circuit type things um, where there are a finite number of possible states for the system. They were quite popular. There was a famous um, conference at Dartmouth in 1956 um, about automata studies, I think it was called, which was a, a kind of an early uh, artificial intelligence conference. And you, and you look through the papers there and there are lots of things about um, automata theory of finite automata, neural networks, a few things about Turing machines, a few things that now would seem fairly obvious to us about Turing machines. I think maybe Claude Shannon's paper about the fact that you can make a universal Turing machine with um, just... Uh, two states if you have enough colors on the tape and things. I think that was in that, um, uh, that, that conference. But anyway, in around 1958, 1959, um, John McCarthy kind of wanted to take some of the results from mathematical logic, particularly recursive function theory, um, and say, can we make a programming language out of this? Now that was a time, just to give people some sense of, of, of timing, the, the early languages, like Fortran, COBOL, and so on, had just sort of come on the scene. There were early versions of those. There were various efforts to kind of uh, standardize programming languages very early in the picture. And in particular, this language called Algol was an effort to sort of bring together all the experts in, in I don't know, automata theory, uh, grammars, things like this, and um, invent the sort of be all and end all language. Uh, it was going to be Algol 60 from 1960. Um, I don't think Algol was ever fully implemented. Um, I think that the ideas from Algol, a bunch of ideas from Algol sort of populated many other programming languages, um, a bunch of ideas that, that maybe I would consider to be a little bit pandering to the details of computers, um, ways to make loops and ways to uh, I don't remember whether Algol, I think Algol had, um, you know, when you have a function in a computer language, there's a question of what are the arguments to that function? What do they, what do they mean? Is it just the value if you say f of x? Is the body of the function f just getting the value of x? That's sometimes called call by value. And um, the other possibility is it's getting the name x. And if something else changes out the value of x from somewhere else, it gets the, that the, whatever is named X is what gets passed as the value to the function F. That's sometimes called call by name. And then the other one that's sometimes discussed is call by reference, which is there is X is a, a pointer to some piece of computer memory that might store whatever it stores. And that thing is being fed to the body of the function F. And there was an effort uh, to kind of classify programming languages in terms of how they did call by name, call by reference, et cetera. I have to say, when my first language SMP uh, was out and about around 1980 or, or so, um, I was talking to, I think, Dana Scott, who was one of the creators of this kind of whole field of denotational semantics. That was sort of a, an effort to make a formal definition of what all the possible meanings that programming languages could have. And I was like, this is how SMP does 
defines functions. It's all based on transformation rules for symbolic patterns. You know, which of these classifications of call by X does it correspond to? Well, it doesn't seem to be any of them. It's a, it's a different kind of approach to thinking about the notion of functions, um, but that's getting us off in a different direction. But anyway, back in 1958 or so, in this sort of context of COBOL, Fortran existed, um, Algol was kind of, uh, had been, its specifications were being developed. Um, COBOL, uh, Algol just squeaked in having recursive functions be allowed. You know, in Fortran, for example, if you had a function, it couldn't call itself. That was something that, for example, when the C programming language came out, that was a, a thing that, yeah, it's of course a function can call itself, no problem. But in Fortran, because of the way that was set up, a function could not call itself. That would tangle the thing into horrible knots and it couldn't do it. So in that kind of context, John McCarthy wanted to use, I think, kind of the formal structures that have been built in, in particular, recursive function theory I'm talking about functions recursively calling themselves, but there had been a whole sort of formal theory of recursion that had been developed starting in the early 1900s. So at the beginning, in, in around uh, the early days of David Hilbert's um, kind of program for representing mathematics in a kind of uh, formal way, um, there had been sort of the question of what is a function in mathematics? How would one represent what could be a function? And so the idea originated of what we would now call primitive recursion, where a function could be defined like the Fibonacci function or the factorial function, you know, f of n is defined in terms of f of n minus one and so on. It's kind of a version of something like mathematical induction. You know, you define something for a value f of n, and then you say, and now we have a rule that tells us what happens for f of n plus one. It's kind of the reverse way of doing that as a way of sort of doing this primitive recursion idea and saying, uh, you know, we define the value of a function in terms of its its um, other recursive values, so to speak. And, and for a while, it looked like primitive recursion would nail every reasonable mathematical function could be described by these primitive recursion operations. Um, and uh, uh, then about 1920, a student of, um, of, of Hilbert's name, Wilhelm Ackermann, came up with this thing called the Ackermann function, which is um, uh, not too hard to describe, actually, but it's a it's a function which you can show can't be represented in terms of primitive recursion, although it seems like a somewhat reasonable mathematical function. I mean, it's kind of the, the, the Ackermann function, just to explain what it is, is when you add numbers together repeatedly, x plus x plus x, that's equivalent to three times x. When you multiply numbers together repeatedly, x times x times x, that's equivalent to x cubed, that's equivalent to a power. Well, what happens if you iterate powers? Well, then you get a thing uh, sometimes called tetration, power towers, whatever. It's a thing where you'd have like two to the two to the two to the two to the two. It gets to be a very big number very quickly. But so that whole family of, of, of things where you are saying, um, I will take this operation and I will uh, apply it some n number of times, that thing as a function of the number of times you're doing a number of levels of, of operator that you're dealing with, that is essentially the Ackermann function. Um, and that function, so that, it's a function both of you went from addition to multiplication to powers to tetration, that's one of the parameters, and then and the value is x or something, and that's the thing that you are multiplying, tetrating, whatever else. That function was something one could show wasn't primitive recursive, yet it seemed like a reasonable kind of function to want to talk about in mathematics. And actually, when Kurt Gödel came to do his Gödel's theorem thing in 1931, um, he made big use of what were called general recursive functions. General recursive functions don't just go down and say f of n depends on f of n minus 1, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. They have a thing often called the mu operator, which says keep on doing this until some condition is valid. So in, in Wolfram language, it would be like a nest while type construct. Anyway, so in that framework of, of sort of the, the idea of recursive functions, this kind of mathematical structure that had been built of what could be represented in terms of what kind of function and so on, that was the framework um, in which John McCarthy uh, wanted to make something which is sort of a more principles-based language. Uh, and that was the origination of LISP. Now, another part of LISP was the idea of, well, what would a function 
really, how would you have sort of functions in Lisp? And that then dovetailed with this whole idea of lambda calculus that had been invented by Alonzo Church in 1935. Um, of what we would now call pure functions, anonymous functions in Wolfram language, the function function um, is the thing that makes a lambda. And so John McCarthy um, also uh, kind of made use of those ideas. Marvin Minsky claimed that John McCarthy had never really read and understood. Um, uh, actually, no, Dana Scott was also, also claimed this. I think both of them claimed this. They'd never really understood Church's papers. I don't know if that's true. I, I would give John McCarthy more credit than that, but I'm not sure. In any case, the um, so one of the things John McCarthy wanted to do in, in Lisp was, was uh, uh, didn't he wanted to have this very pure idea of functions of functions of functions of functions, and he kind of represented all those things with parentheses um, and uh, to, to indicate you know, what was the function, what were its arguments, and so on, uh, so-called S expressions. I, I was looking recently at his original papers on this, and he had this idea that he was really going to have these M expressions, these kind of mathematical notation things where you have F brackets, he even had square brackets, X, Y. But he said, for now, because it's easier to write the parser, we're just going to use it with parentheses. And turns out, as is so often the case, you know, best intentions, but never actually got back to doing it, M expressions, which look a lot like kind of Wolfram language type symbolic expressions were never implemented. And so sort of the original Lisp was kind of the, um, uh, this thing with lots of parentheses and that's kind of, that's been a trademark feature of the way that Lisp is usually presented ever since. Now, the original versions of Lisp, I, I don't know exactly what was done in terms of their very, very original implementation. I know there was a, a Lisp one, there was a Lisp 1.5. These were things I think in the early sixties and they were implemented on the IBM 704 computer. And famously, two of the key operations, car and cutter, uh, for list, um, what would those be? Those would be, um, uh, what are those? Those are rest and first operations in, um, uh, in Wolfram language, I think. Um, those were machine code instructions on the IBM 704. And they sort of got into the Lisp language very early. So I think the very earliest Lisps were uh, implemented on these IBM computers. I think then one of the sort of uh, breakout ideas in Lisp was, you know, let's use Lisp as sort of a, a language that can represent symbolic kinds of things and that can represent symbolic AI, whatever that might mean. And one of the sort of test cases for early symbolic AI, one of the things, you know, it's, it's one feature of the, the history of artificial intelligence that people tend to say, oh, as soon as we have computers that do X, then we'll know we've succeeded in building artificial intelligence and we'll have computers we consider to be smart. But the goalpost of what X is has progressively moved over the years. And one of the early goalposts is when we can get a computer to do kind of college level mathy stuff, then we'll know we've succeeded in AI. And so back in the 1960s, there were projects, particularly at MIT, I think, um, that were aimed at being able to do things like college-level symbolic integration, college-level symbolic differentiation. And so there were a, a series of, of programs that people tried to make with, um, uh, with names like Saint Symbolic Integration. I don't know exactly what that, what that uh, stood for. And there were, I mean, there were things where people kind of pulled in different kind of interface modalities, like, oh, what if we could actually draw the formulas somewhere? You know, let's have that technology as well, um, rather than sort of factoring it into let's solve the problem of just taking an already kind of symbolically represented thing and working out the integral. But in any case, one of the things that happened was that Lisp became sort of a favored implementation language for those kinds of efforts to sort of do symbolic kinds of things, for example, in mathematics in the 1960s, mostly around MIT. And then when this thing called Maxima started to get built, which was sort of a, an effort that came out of a, I think came out of a thing called SIN, which was a symbolic integration program and, and a few other, few other pieces, it was an effort to kind of build a, a mathematical computation system. And the, so one of the big ideas was let's do it in Lisp. And so for that was invented a thing called MacLisp, um, and a Mac stood for the multiple access computer. It was, I think, a PDP-10, um, at least when I met it, it was a PDP-10. It was a computer that was very early to the ARPANET. 
it was a thing, you know, the ARPANET was the predecessor of the internet. Um, that machine was uh, Node 236, as I recall, on the ARPANET. And you would just type, you know, into your, into your terminal, you would type at O236, and it would say connecting, 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 and then you would get a command line prompt for that computer, the multiple access computer um, that was uh, uh, at MIT physically and was a PDP-10 made by Digital Equipment Corporation. And uh, PDP-10s had all kinds of funky things. I think they had 36-bit instruction words, as I recall, um, the 36-bit words for their memory and things like that. But in any case, the, the um, uh, Project Mac, the multiple access computer, this kind of time-shared computer that would be made available through the ARPANET to the world, so to speak, um, that was the, the thing that there was a Mac Lisp that was developed that was partly to in the in the service of Mac Maxima, which was sort of this mathematics thing. I think Mac Lisp may have been used for other kinds of AI, uh, sort of uh, kind of AI scenario experiments at that time as well. So anyway, that that progressed up through. Let's see, I I used that kind of thing starting around 1976. Um, I rarely programmed, in fact, never really programmed seriously directly in Mac Lisp. Um, but, um, uh, and, um, but that was a thing that was sort of available through that, through that computer system. Then there was the idea of, look, this Lisp is a good idea. Let's kind of make it more broadly available. It wasn't easy to get it to work on the sort of standard computers of the day. Now, remember, by the late 1970s, uh, one was transitioning from the pure mainframe computers to the so-called world of mini computers. So a mainframe computer is a thing that's sort of, in some approximation, only touched by people in wearing white coats type thing, and a thing that sort of hidden deep in the data center um, of an organization and, and kind of IBM was the, the longtime leader of kind of the mainframe world with companies like, um, uh, well, what became Unisys, which was Univac and, um, oh my, not Honeywell, was it Honeywell? Honeywell then maybe broke off another piece, I'm not sure. But anyway, there were, IBM was sort of the number one computer company making mainframe computers. The upstart at that time was particularly this company, DEC, Digital Equipment Corporation, which became the number two computer company in the world. And it made, among other things, mini computers. And um, initially it was the PDP-1, PDP-2, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. And these got to be sort of increasingly sophisticated computers. The PDP-11 was a particularly famous one. Um, and then it jumped from the PDP-11 to the VAX-11. Uh, VAX 11780, I think, was the first version. And the VAX was the virtual address extension of the PDP-11. It wasn't completely clear, I think, what relationship it completely had to the PDP-11. But the big thing about the VAX was that it had so-called virtual memory. So, so one of the issues is you have a computer, it has memory. You know, initially it was, uh, uh, you know, ferrite core memory, then it became transistor memory, um, microprocessor uh, uh, memory. Um, but the usual thing was there was a certain amount of memory that the computer had, and you would write a program that would have to uh, fit in the computer's memory, and it would have to address uh, data that was in the memory of the computer. So the big innovation of the VAX was this virtual address extension. So the idea was to have so-called virtual memory, where there was a certain amount of memory that was resident in the actual random access memory in the RAM of the computer. And there was other extra memory that was, uh, could just be sent out to disk. Um, and so the idea was, you know, you could have a program that didn't fit in the physical memory of the computer. Your computer might have one megabyte of memory, let's say, if, it, if you were very, very lucky. But you might have a program that wanted to use 100 megabytes of memory. And the idea was that the, the data that was being used in the program will be sort of underneath you, it will be swapped out to disk, brought back again as needed. There was this concept as it is, this concept of an address translation unit in which you give it, let's say a 32-bit address, and it says, where is that actual piece of memory? Is it available directly in RAM or do I have to go to disk to go fetch that? And that was the sort of big innovation of the VAX um, was to make that possible. Now, in a sense, 
in modern times, as the you know, it's always been a sort of a, a complicated uh, trade-off as the price of memory and semiconductor memory and so on has come down. And uh, there's sort of this question of, does virtual memory really make sense? And some devices like, like uh, most mobile devices just don't have virtual memory. They have whatever they have is memory that is in, the, is in just semiconductor memory um, in the device. There's no little disk spinning around. I mean, there were disks back in the, the iPod and things like that had a disk in it. But as, as one went to iPhones and things, the, the concept of virtual memory, I think, has sort of dropped away there. And in a sense, as soon as one's using virtual memory, it's like, well, everything's going to be a lot slower because you have to spend time, you know, disks go around at 60 revolutions per second, and you've got to wait for the piece of, uh, piece of data to come around on the disk before you can pick it up and use it. So that's kind of a, a, a thing you don't want to have to do. And of course, in the way that memory is actually built for computers, you end up with these multiple levels of hierarchy of memory from the, you know, the level one, the L1 cache, the L2 cache, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera, things that are, you know, on the CPU where the very most hottest sort of parts of what you're computing with are stored in those parts of memory and compilers try and figure out what to put where and, and various kinds of other things that microprocessors figure that out. And kind of the bottom of the pile is virtual memory, put it out to disk. Um, but in any case, back in around um, uh, what must have been 1978-ish, uh, you know, the VAX started coming out and, and there were a number of other uh, competing companies. Data General was another company that um, uh, was in that business. And so there started to be computers big enough that you could really implement a LISP system in principle. But the actual path that was chosen was a different path. Instead, there were a couple of companies that got started where the idea was to actually build computers that in their hardware would be optimized for dealing with Lisp. And there were two companies, one called LMI, Lisp Machines Incorporated, another called Symbolics. Um, these were both uh, basically MIT spinoff companies that uh, had the idea of, of, um, of building sort of a hardware Lisp optimized computer. And not only would the hardware be Lisp based, the operating system would also be Lisp based. It was actually a pretty good idea, but I think it was ahead of its time. And always when you're sort of entangling doing the hardware with doing the software, you've you're set yourself up for a much more difficult problem. And those two companies, I mean, there were there were sort of pieces of that um, uh, that sort of had been associated with a, a chess playing machine. There's a chap called Richard Greenblatt who was involved with, with LMI, as I recall, who um, had been sort of a builder of a, of a hardware um, chess playing machine, and that was kind of technology that flowed into that. Um, the, uh, so these two companies got started, and um, unfortunately, it didn't go that well. Uh, there were companies that started using these list machines, but it was not a, a popular kind of thing. And there was a lot of technology that was pretty nice. I mean, they were using the, the sort of the display technology that had come out of Xerox Park, the you know, bitmap displays, and so on. Very, very forward-looking but it didn't really work out from a business point of view. And I think when I built SMP starting in 1979, I certainly considered using LISP, but it was completely impractical to do it at that time. They're just on any ordinary computer. It simply didn't run fast enough. The computers didn't have enough memory. It was not a, a, a promising thing. And so I implemented SMP in C, which was at that time an up and coming uh, sort of modern newfangled language. I think John McCarthy was never very happy that I had done that because it felt like, you know, Lisp had defined itself as the language of AI-like things. And we had a great big example of something which was sort of AI-like and not in Lisp. Well, then I, I think the a footnote to history about LMI and symbolics and so on, I think one of the people who was sort of in that orbit um, was Richard Stallman. Um, and uh, at least I, I'm trying to remember whether he's told me the story, whether he's um, whether this is a mythical story told by other people, exactly what the status of the story is, I'm not quite sure. But the, um, the sort of the picture painted was, you know, at MIT, all the hackers, so-called, were getting recruited by either LMI or Symbolics. And some of them were getting equity stakes in those companies and so on. And for one reason or another, um, Richard Stallman wasn't on everybody's favorite person list. And so he didn't end up uh, going to either of those companies. And so he sort of said, uh, and again, this may be a, one of these apocryphal mythical stories, although I, I'm, I've definitely talked to, 
I'm, I'm trying to remember exactly who told me what and so on, but um, in kind of a, a, uh, a fit of peak, it's like, look, if you guys are not going to, you know, have me involved in your companies, I'm just going to make all the software free. And, um, uh, you know, that was um, uh, apocryphally, at least, um, the origin of that, um, uh, that effort. But anyway, so, so going into uh, beyond that, there was sort of ideas like, let's make a standard for Lisp. There was a thing called Common Lisp, which was an attempt to do that, which became very, very, very complicated. I'm not sure how fully it was ever implemented. Um, in a sense, the, the concepts there are things that uh, are you know, very much along the lines of things that, that I've ended up building with Wolfram Language and so on. And uh, certainly, uh, well, Guy Steele, who was a person who worked on the Common Lisp thing, I, I knew him at Thinking Machines Corporation, where I was a consultant. He was he worked there. Um, he was somewhat involved in the. I'm afraid the the um, uh, the complexification of what I thought was a pretty beautiful thing called C Star, which was a, a kind of extension, a parallel extension of C that I had developed for, or at least created the specification for um, for the the connection machine computer. But um, uh, it. Um, uh, so I'm not sure how fully that got implemented. I think the I, I remember when I was working on on the early design of Mathematica. This must have been 1986. I remember looking at a, at a common list book and um, uh, trying to make sure that we were sort of covering a bunch of things in there. Um, I think that um, so you know those are those are adventures that happened. You know what's often said by people who are involved with Lisp is you know in the end every programming language recreates Lisp, which is in some sense true, because it has, you know, it has a certain, there's a certain pathway to universal computation, and it has some good primitives for that pathway, which in a sense came out of lambda calculus and recursive functions and so on. And in a sense, in my own efforts to have sort of the best possible computational language environment, uh, I've tried to make use of everything that we learned from the hundred years or so of mathematical logic development that's come before us. And the trick really is, is to try and meld those concepts together. We know they're equivalent, but how do you actually in practice meld them together? And I think one that's been sort of the only standout loser is the is combinators, this idea of, of being able to specify things without any variables at all. The SK combinators invented by Moses Schoenfinkel in 1920 that we were just celebrating the centenary of at the end of last year. Um, these are an idea that were very far ahead of their time very much defined kind of a lot of this notion of symbolic structures as things you could compute on, not that Moses Schoenfinkel talked about computation. He more thought about it in terms of mathematics and logic and so on. You know, John McCarthy, I re noticed recently in his original paper about Lisp, basically said, well, in principle, we could use combinators to represent kind of the way that data flows into functions and out of functions and so on. But it's not clear anybody will understand how these work. And that's been the continuing experience to today that we just don't, combinators are not a thing that are very easy for us, uh, sort of uh, mere mortal humans or something to wrap our brains around. They're very beautiful. They have avoid the need to ever name a variable. It's kind of like a, uh, um, a world where we speak language without nouns or pronouns. We, we can just say this flows into this, flows into this, flows into this, flows into this. Of course, I can't use the word this, um, but uh, uh, it's kind of just, you know, you're defining the plumbing, so to speak, but you're, and you could sort of feed anything in at the beginning to the pipes, um, but you have this elaborate way to define the plumbing. And we just haven't, in programming languages to date, and I've certainly looked at this quite a bit, we really just haven't found a way because in a sense, programming languages are attempting to make and, and more so even computational language is attempting to make this bridge between sort of us, the humans, and what we understand and, and can think about and what computers can, can do. And so it isn't very useful to have that bridge if we don't have something that we humans can wrap our brains around. Now, of course, the, the early programming languages were kind of very much pandering to the very detailed structure of you've got these registers in this computer and you have to load them up in this way and you can move the data from here to there. My goal in building both language and computational language in general is, you know, can we get away from having to worry about how the computer implements all this stuff and get to the point where we're really working with 
the raw ideas of computation and the things that we humans can actually understand. I might just give a shout out to another uh, programming language that originated not long after Lisp. Um, and to me, I think was a sort of great achievement, which was APL. It stood for a programming language. It was developed by a person called Ken Iverson, who had been sort of involved in the Harvard orbit and people like uh, Howard Aiken, who had built the Mark I computer at Harvard and so on. It can't kind of come out of that tradition. And Ken Iverson, the big thing that he wanted to understand was not these recursive structures of the type that John McCarthy was looking at, but arrays, kind of these sort of rec rectangular, sort of multidimensional rectangular kinds of array structures and operations that would be done on them. And in a sense, Ken Iverson made a much more kind of ordinary mathematics style play at thinking about how do you think about arrays? How do you have operations that operate on arrays? How do you how do you operate on a certain axis of an array? How do you unravel an array, what we would now call flatten? How would you do all these kinds of operations? And I have to say, I never really used APL. Um, APL had was a sort of specification um, that uh, got created in the 1960s. Uh, Ken Iverson worked at IBM and um, uh, IBM actually implemented APL. But one thing which was sort of a very interesting mistake that Ken Iverson made was he said, look, he's trying to make this essentially, essentially notation for algorithms that would represent things like take and drop in a list and you know, would have ways to do that and apply this function across this axis of this array, all these kinds of things. And he had the idea, look, we've got mathematical notation. It's got all these symbols like plus signs and, and you know, equal signs and all those kinds of things. Let's make a notation for these kind of computational operations. So he made this notation and there are things like, you know, iota, an iota-like thing is what we now call range. And I think a, um, boy, I'm not sure whether I can, I think slashes have something to do with what we would now use, but now we slash at in more from language, uh, map operation. Uh, I'm not sure, but but anyway, there were a bunch of notations, and some of these notations you absolutely couldn't find on a, on a standard computer keyboard at the time. So you had to have these special APL keyboards that would use the special APL character set that would introduce kind of the um, uh, all of these sort of new computational APL notations for for these array operations. I think the problem was. If it had been just one new operation that maybe people could have typed with some combination of letters on a keyboard or something like that, it might have worked. But by the time you have 30 or 40 of these things, it's like nobody's going to, it's too big a cognitive load to actually be able to learn all that stuff. I mean, the result was you get these beautifully short, compact programs, but they're very hard to understand. Once, you've, once you're really deeply in that world, yes, you can understand them. But from the outside, if you just to show him, here's this program, it's like, I don't understand what this does. Now, in a sense, if you take even some of those sort of prize programs, you translate them into Wolfram language, and instead of having some, I don't know, you know, weird comery thing, or, or instead of having some triangle that represents uh, grade up, grade down sorting thing, you have the word sort, or you have the word even map, you know, you are, or flatten, for example, people deal with words pretty well. They don't deal with notation so well. They can learn notation, but they learn it slowly, sort of one operation at a time. So it was too much, too fast. And I think that that kind of detailed issue of notation kind of doomed that um, uh, APL at that time. I mean, I, I know, I knew Ken Iverson, um, and he, uh, uh, you know, he always said what he really had wanted to do with APL was invent a this kind of mathematical style notation for computation. What I would now say that we've we've gone a long way with in the computational language that we had in, in Wolfram language, although we're leveraging English basically as the language to explain what we're talking about, rather than inventing our, our new kind of Leibniz, Outred, whatever, 1600s-ish notation for all of these kinds of operations. And as I say, I think one gets the opportunity, you know, maybe once every five years, we get the opportunity to introduce a new sort of, you got to learn this notation type thing, um, but not more often than that, really.
Uh, and now we can go back and see whether I'm right about whether how often it's been. It might be more on average once every two years or something for orphan language, I'm not sure. But anyway, so, so but APL, I think the worlds of APL and LISP, although both, I see them as being the two most visionary early programming languages, um, but I think they were fairly separate worlds uh, for a long time. I think what I tried to do in, in building SMP and then orphan language is capturing some of the some of the sort of best ideas from those languages. I have to say I was was a little bit sad and I think it was 1989 I was like the keynote speaker at the APL annual conference in New York and uh, a bunch of people there were sort of saying look you know Mathematica is the future of APL and uh, I remember I had lunch with Ken Iverson at that conference and and um, I, I think he felt that that was not a bad kind of uh, it was not a bad thing that the you know these ideas you know kind of had a had a direction there and I, th I think APL itself uh, spun off a thing called J um, and uh, APL it's, it's always a funny thing because in the world of kind of uh, finance and particularly quantitative finance there are all these elaborate kind of technology stacks that get built by all these different companies and um, uh, in a sense you know the big thing in quantitative finance is I've got this incredibly clever idea for how to, you know, get ahead of the market. And I'm going to keep using that idea as long as it works. And by the way, I don't want anybody else to know my idea because if other people know my idea, it stops being nearly as valuable. And so there's a tremendous kind of desire to have these sort of very independent technology stacks that um, would be, uh, and one of the ways that I think that sort of the, the ecosystem evolved was that these different companies uh, ended up often building their technology stacks using different uh, uh, different programming languages. And so, for example, I think um, Drexel Lambert was kind of the, I remember the last of the Pascal, the big Pascal houses. And I think um, Morgan Stanley was the big APL uh, uh, kind of um, place. And I think, um, uh, you know, in modern times, like, you know, Jane Street is the big O'Camel place. And it's kind of interesting. And it, it's, it's, I think it's a very nice thing that, that um, a lot of these sort of innovative um, programming language ideas get some, sort of some extra mileage through, through even just through their exoticity, so to speak, because there's, this, there's that extra advantage to exoticity there. I'd like to think that our language gets used by all these folk and, um, uh, you know, as we build bridges to these other different languages, we're able to, to sort of get the best of both worlds. But anyway, long, uh, long story about um, the, uh, the history of LISP. I hope I covered um, uh, the things that were of interest there. Um, okay, let's see. There are... Um, Oh, that's an interesting question from Aaron here. Was control, well, actually, I think you may probably mean control equals used in Mathematica before Wolfram Alpha. Um, no, it wasn't. Uh, you know, one thing that's been nice about, you know, what are you going to use those control keys for? What are you going to use those all those characters for? The ASCII character set has remained very fixed all these years, you know, the back ticks and hash signs and all those kinds of things. It's pretty much been the same set for the whole time I've been doing computing, I think. I think that the, um, uh, well, no. When I first used a, a teleprinter to produce paper tapes for computers, yeah, okay, so there've been a couple of evolutions of the character set. Um, first, okay, so, in the very early days, when people started having kind of a definite way to type things, not using a telegraph with, you know, Morse code type stuff, uh, the next technology was this thing called a telex machine. Um, I wonder when that originated. Probably the 1940s. Probably it was originally electromechanical. I certainly saw them in use by the... by. Uh, my, my father's little company had a telex machine and that was, um, must have been, I must have first seen it around 1965 or something. And um, the, uh, a telex machine, 
at first it was a just you type, it sends a, a essentially a telegram wire out to another telex machine. And it would have a, how did that work? It had, it used to have a rotary dial phone that you would sort of dial the other telex machine. Yeah, I think you were kind of sending text messages, but through a phone line like medium. But then the big innovation was that you could kind of, at, at first you had to just like type in real time, just like if you're connected with a, a telegraph, telegraph you know, you're, you know, you're clicking that, that key and it's going to the, in real time to the place you're going to. But the, the innovation that I'm guessing was early 60s, but might have been slightly earlier than that, was the idea of using paper tape as a way to sort of queue up your message. And so what you would do is you would first offline, you would create this paper tape, which had a line of holes. Each character was a line of holes. It was used to be um, five hole paper tape. And that was some... Um, that line of holes, each line of holes and the paper tape would represent one character. You would, you would create the paper tape. And then when you wanted to send your telex message, you would, um, uh, uh, you would load that into the telex machine and the telex machine would just automatically sort of read the paper tape one, one line at a time and send out the messages. Ah, oh, yes, I'm remembering the issue. The issue was you, in the previous version, you would dial the phone effectively with the telex machine. And let's say you were dialing to Timbuktu, that it could be expensive to have the line to Timbuktu open, but you as the telex operator was sitting there just typing the keys and you had to do it as fast as possible. It became a much better proposition when you could just use paper tape and you would just you know, dial Timbuktu and you, know, you could then load in the paper tape and as quickly as possible, all those characters would be sent through. But that was kind of five hole paper tape. Then the next thing was eight hole paper tape. And I guess they developed these two standards, EPSIDIC and ASCII. EPSIDIC was a pretty IBM oriented standard. Oh, I should explain in programming mainframes, one wasn't typically using paper tape, one was typically using cards. So a card is this thing about so big and uh, uh, a card had 80, uh, 80 columns on the card. And so we'd use a, you would use a card punch machine and um, you, would, uh, you would say you press a button, it was usually a blue button, it would bring the card in and then you would start typing keys and the successive columns in the card would be punched out um, according to the key you specified. And so when people say, you know, 80 characters per line, that's a story of cards. And in Fortran, the first six, um, first six columns, as I recall, were sort of reserved and you could put a comment, you could sort of comment out um, a card by, by, by changing something in the first six columns, as I recall. And um, so cards were a thing and, and you'd have these card decks. And so a big program might be physically, you know, a foot high of cards. And the thing that was the absolute horror was, what if you drop your card deck? and cards are scattered all over the place. I'm not sure, I don't think that ever happened to me. I certainly was aware of people who dropped card decks. And then, then at some point it became the case that when you would generate a card deck, it would come with some kind of numbering data. I think that was what was in the, the first six columns, you could have numbers for the cards. And so if horrors, you dropped your card deck, you could in principle put those cards in a sorting machine and um, it would sort them back into order. I mean, it's worth realizing this card technology had originated back in the very early 1900s. Um, it was the kind of the Hollerith uh, te technology, which was originally used for the US census, for example, and was the kind of original kind of technology of IBM, um, was, uh, card, uh, was, was cards and being able to do, um, uh, being able to like sort things according to cards where you'd literally, you know, use rods to sort of pick out cards that would have, these particular holes punched in them and so on. But anyway, that was a technology that was used for the mainframe computers and so on. Um, but the, then the question was, well, which characters should actually appear in the, you know, you've got five holes. That means in principle, you've got 32 possible characters. Which characters should appear? Well, with 32, you only get, um, you, you only get capital letters. You don't get separated large and small letters. Um, so that had to await sort of eight hole paper tape and, and these, um, these sort of uh, 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 bigger media for representing things. But then the question was, what 
what characters would actually appear. And I think in Epsodic, there are some characters that now appear on standard keyboards that were not present in Epsodic. So when ASCII kind of won out, and that really happened, I would say, uh, still an SMP in the early 1980s, we had to worry about Epsodic as a, as a character encoding. Um, I think that kind of went out by probably the mid 1980s. I don't think we had to worry about Epsodic when we started building um, uh, building Wolfram language and building Mathematica in 1986. Um, but uh, this question of sort of what characters would appear was sort of then very much determined. And uh, of course, I remember for, even from typewriters, some of the characters that we now have as sort of special characters were on there. Like, like for example, an at sign was on there. Uh, originally it was like, if you were typing, um, uh, you know, a, a, a price you would say, um, or you would you were typing some kind of um, invoice or something, you would say, you know, I'm buying three oranges at six pence each. So, you know, that three at six D each or something. And that at sign was used for that purpose. It was kind of a commercial sign. One of the things that's often confusing in these days is that the hash sign is um, that hash sign on, on sort of in the British tradition that was the pound sign, as in pounds sterling, you know, the L with the decorations was in sort of that position on the typewriter. And then something which just is utterly confusing to me, the pounds as an LB, the, um, uh, the weight somehow ended up getting represented by that hash sign in some way. And then even more confusingly, when the Bell system, when AT&T was, um, was originally developing a touch tone phones. They had this grid of of, uh, of letters. It was a, a whatever a three by four grid of of, of of sorry a three by four grid of keys that were the you know one two three four five six etc. And um, they let's see they they added two sort of bonus keys in addition to the the ten because they wanted a grid of twelve. And that grid of twelve, by the way, translated into this touch tone tones, you know, when you press a three, what it would do is it had a certain location on that three by four grid. And there were two tones that were produced that were sent down the phone line. One tone that rep whose, whose frequency represented kind of the vertical height of the key and one that represented the horizontal position of the key. And so those two touch tones that were hard to whistle, unless you're a bird that can produce two tones, but um, that were hard to whistle, um, were the things that represented, you know, the number three or whatever um, being sent on the on the telephone line, and this the um, these sort of two extra bonus keys. One was a star, and the other was this thing we now usually call hash sign. Um, that the official name for that in the Bell system was Octothorpe, which I guess came from the eight tentacles of the of the of the shape of the of the character. But anyway, that was um, so. There, you know, it was a slow evolution of these kinds of characters and what could be used and so on. Um, but ASCII was for a long time the thing. But of course, then the question came up: Well, what about if you were even using French or something which had accented characters, or you were using, you know, Polish which has all kinds of extra accented characters, or you were using Cyrillic, you know, Russian or something, or using Greek? You know, how would that work? And so what happened? I think IBM was quite involved in this. Is that there were these sort of standards for how to um, represent kind of, let's say the, the French character set, the, the, um, uh, the Turkish character set, the, um, uh, uh, the, the, the Russian character set and so on. And so that became the ISO Latin one, ISO Latin two, ISO Latin three character sets. Each one kind of the same set of, uh, these were eight bits so the same set of actually 128 possible uh, characters, but they were sort of overwritten. So, so what in English would be a such and such character, if you used a different character set, that would be the French accent, you know, E acute type um, character, or it might be a, an alpha in Greek. And so they sort of evolved these things, ISO Latin 1, ISO Latin 2, Latin 3, and it's like a bunch of languages fit into ISO Latin 1. And I, I don't actually remember now how exotic it got. I'm not sure if the Icelandic thorn character made it into ISO Latin one, but by the time I think some of the Polish characters were in like ISO Latin two at least, and a few languages had the sort of misfortune of being in ISO Latin three, and then there was ISO Greek um, and so on.
And so for a long time, it was like, an, and we still have this capability in Morphine Language today of saying, it's an 8-bit character, but we're going to have it be interpreted as, a, as Greek or as Russian or whatever else. It was very confusing. Well, eventually, as computer memories got bigger and so on, and this was by now in the early 1990s, um, people realized that it would be a good idea to sort of standardize the, the notation for all these kinds of things and to try and sort of put together everything in a single sort of standard for how to represent the, the glyphs of the world. And so that's how the Unicode Consortium was, was created. And um, uh, we were quite involved in that. And I think uh, uh, Mathematica and Wolfram Language, we were one of the first applications to make use of Unicode, which at the time used 16 bit 16 bits to represent possible characters. And so then the rush was on, what was going to make it into those two to the 16, 65,536 possible slots in Unicode, what were going to be the, the, the official characters that made it there. And uh, by the way, there had already been these ways of representing uh, Chinese and Japanese um, in, um, uh, in using the CJK, uh, um, way of doing things which were sort of combinations of characters, combinations of the 8-bit the characters to represent uh, some of the 20, 30,000 ideograms that exist in those, in those languages. Um, so sort of the, the race was on in the early 90s, you know, what was going to make it into Unicode, we were actually happy to be able to contribute some characters in the mathematical space of Unicode um, that uh, were things like the differential D character and things like this. Um, and there was sort of a, a big kind of uh, effort to see what, what were the different things that might be useful in math and all these other areas. And I, I, I remember there was a, a sort of a terrible moment when things like, I think the language, I think uh, Georgian, if I remember correctly, had some issues in, in not getting included in some version of Unicode. Um, and uh, Korean kind of was, which takes up, you know, Hangul characters have these multiple segments and things. And there was some issues with that. But in the end, uh, Unicode got created, and it's been a useful standard. Now, of course, like everything, 16 bits turned out not to be enough. And so as people started worrying about, I don't know, Babylonian cuneiform, it didn't fit in the 16-bit space of ordinary Unicode. Emoticons, emoji, uh, you know, the, the most basic ones would fit in 16-bit in Unicode. But uh, uh, when you were, you know, having an emoji that represented, you know, a, a, a happy fox or something, and that became a separate emoji, and you were kind of recreating the, the history of Egyptian hieroglyphs or something, um, the, uh, that, that wouldn't fit in 16-bit Unicode. And so there was a number of years ago, it's, um, uh, um, it started to, uh, uh, there started to be this idea of non-plane zero Unicode, plane one Unicode. And like Babylon and Cuneiform is a proud contributor to plane one Unicode. And of course, it's a big pain to, um, uh, to actually update the way that string manipulation and so on works in software to deal with characters that are no longer, you know, went from the 8-bit characters to the 16-bit characters to the 32-bit characters. And there were all kinds of, you know, when you store a big long string, you know, you're storing a genome, for example, you really don't want to use 32 bits to represent every A, G, C, and T in the human genome, because actually there are only four of those base pairs and uh, or a few more if you include weirder forms of life. Um, but uh, you don't need to be using all 32 bits for those things. And so that's a, uh, that's a place where there's all kinds of fancy footwork in the implementation to make sort of optimal use of that while not making the code too messy. Um, okay, let's see. Well, questions here. Um, yeah, Dan is commenting. It's it's crazy to think that the history of computing is less than 50 years old. Yeah, yeah, right. I mean, the thing that really amazes me is, you know, at this point, Wolfram Language is 33 years old. And that's kind of more than half the total history of, of, of programming languages. Um, it's, a, it's a remarkable thing, kind of how quickly the idea of computation, and it's a typical thing in the, in the way technology works. You know, once a methodological approach opens up, it's kind of like it rushes into that space. And, and that's what's happened with computing, although the stack we're building is really a tall stack and, and it's had many different layers that needed to be built. 
D0 is commenting the ASCII table was eight bits. Yes, the ASCII table is eight bits long. It's a question from Dan about, have I used fourth? What do I think about stack-based programming languages? You know, I haven't personally used fourth. Um, fourth was a language developed originally by radio astronomers for radio telescopes and things like that. It's a very minimal language where it's really just a push things on the stack. It's kind of like the HP calculators were the other very stack-based based languages. Um, and uh, it's kind of a, a very um, sort of the idea is let's have a very, very minimal language, which requires sort of minimum space to implement and can be implemented on a, on a very tiny thing. I mean, in these days, things like microcontrollers, like Arduinos and so on, they tend to use a variant of C as their language. Um, but there are other languages like Lua, for example, which is popular in some games. That's another very minimal language. Um, these, are, these are sort of interesting ideas. I mean, I, I have to tell a, a story about stack-based languages and, and radio telescopes and so on. The um, uh, years ago, there's this movie called Contact that was sort of uh, developed by Carl Sagan originally, which is an extraterrestrial first contact movie starring Jodie Foster um, as a, an astronomer who is uh, notably um, uses the VLA, Very Large Array Telescope in Socorro, New Mexico to, um, uh, um, to kind of, um, uh, you know, first detect the extraterrestrial signal. I, I kind of have to tell a story about that. This must have been sometime in the 80s, um, early to mid 80s. I was like, um, with a friend of mine, I was, um, uh, was like um, uh, doing a pseudo tourist trip in New Mexico. I think maybe at some time when I was consulting at Los Alamos or something. And we thought, okay, let's go visit uh, the VLA. In this now uh, VLA, you know, radio telescopes, kind of the shtick in radio telescopes, you've got to be away from civilization because you don't want all that nasty radio noise. And like Green Bank and West Virginia has this whole, you know, cell phone free town and so on to support kind of the don't don't have cell phones near, don't have radio near a radio telescope. But in any case, so the VLA is in a very sort of obscure place, but I I particularly uh was struck, and I'm sure it isn't the case anymore, but driving to the VLA in the sort of the middle of nowhere, go through this town that says, you know, I forget what its name was, that um, uh, had been some kind of gold rush town. And it had a big thing saying, you know, uh, this town had become a ghost town, but it is a ghost town no longer. And it had a picture of the radio telescope and so on on the sign. But the sign was on a rotting piece of wood and everything was abandoned. And so it was back to being a ghost town again. I just thought that was kind of a, a strange and a strange thing. But in any case, the, the VLA is um, uh, uh, featured in that movie. And um, in the movie, there's a very elaborate control system for the VLA. And um, I uh, thought, gosh, I uh, for some reason, I knew people who worked on the, on the visual effects for that movie. And I also knew radio astronomers. Um, and so I thought, gosh, you know, why don't I at least connect these folks? Because maybe the people who worked on the movie have all kinds of nifty software that they've built that might be useful to radio astronomers. And so I asked the question, you know, in the in the movie, there's all kinds of elaborate sort of thing for, for setting up a, a observing process on the VLA. I said, how does it work in real life? How is it actually done? Oh, well, actually, we use Lotus 123 macros to, to set it up. So that was kind of a a um, the, the 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 fact is is a little bit less glamorous than the than the um, than the movie, so to speak. Um, anyway, okay, let's see. Maybe um, uh, gosh, all kinds of questions here. I don't. I shouldn't go on too much longer here. Um, there's a bunch of, of mathematical questions, which I'm happy to try to address, um, but in a different place. Um, a question here from Atori about what's the history of zero and void through science? Yeah, it's an interesting question. You know, it's like an idea like zero seems completely obvious to us today. But it was surprisingly unobvious in the early history of computation or early history of mathematics. And, you know, in a sense, why would you ever want zero? 
It's nothing. There's, why don't you just give the number you want to give? It's two or something. Why would we ever talk about zero? I think what, what happens is you see sort of increasing systematization in these areas. And at some point, it becomes useful to have this notion of zero. And I think people say there's some, there's some first use of zero that's in some, uh, what is it, Cambodian or something, um, source from, I don't know, I think, uh, you know, there are Indian uh, places where people talk about zeros having been used maybe um, a couple of thousand years ago and so on. But I think the, the serious use of zero took a surprisingly long time to develop. And people had We've got numbers and, you know, one, two, three, four. Okay, where, when, you know, when do we need, there isn't a number at all, it's just zero. When do we need negative numbers? Strangely, the use of negative numbers as sort of a routine thing didn't really happen until people wanted to do the extremely obscure thing of solving cubic equations. That was Cardano and people in the 1400s um, wanting, and in fact, kind of complex numbers sort of showed up at more or less the same time that negative numbers became routine things to be talking about. People hadn't needed kind of the streamlined notion of a negative number before that time. It was, it was sort of really forcing this idea of the casus irreducibilis, the irreducible case of the cubic equation that forced both of these ideas to sort of go get, because you needed a more streamlined way to represent numbers. And that was kind of the, the approach there. Now, it's sort of interesting to see in more modern times other examples of that. And I see that routinely in kind of the things we design for Wolfram Language and so on. These concepts that at first it's like, we don't really need that. But then, well, actually, we need to be much more systematic about this. You know, something like somebody was asking about the, the history of things like fold and nest. You know, there's the idea of you've got a list of numbers. OK, you're accumulating them. You're finding cumulative sums of you know, first, the first number, then the first two numbers, three numbers, four numbers, and so on. Well, then you realize that's a general operation of folding a function over that list. And so you kind of get to another level of abstraction. And that's kind of like what I think happened with things like zero is you know, that, that, that's the way that the, the null thing is, um, uh, is something that you don't think about until you're being very systematic. And it's kind of, I would say, almost one of the hallmarks of, I don't know, I've noticed with kids who um, uh, you know, are, are sort of doing uh, technical things and so on. Any kid who says kind of, and what about the case of zero? You know, what about the, the corner case of zero? That kid has some probability of turning into a pure mathematician, so to speak, because that's kind of the mindset of what about that, what about that abstracted corner case and so on? Well, let's see. Uh, maybe one more thing and then I should go. Um, um, yeah, someone is asking here, what about for debts and things like that? Snack asks for negative numbers. You know, in, 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 and now you're going to probe a piece of, of lack of knowledge that I have, but in, um, 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 in the entry, in the invention of, of double entry bookkeeping, the, you know, Luca Pacioli and so on in the 1400s and so on was inventing, it was 1500s, um, inventing uh, what is now sort of the standard method of accounting. Well, you know, there aren't really negative numbers. There's the, there's the credits column and there's the debits column. And maybe in modern times you put parentheses around the negative numbers, but that's to represent it's a debit. But you don't really have to pick up the number and say, this is a negative number. You really, the structure is arranged so that we're talking about credits and debits. So you don't really have to have this notion of a disembodied negative number to deal with. And it's sort of, again, an interesting thing. When is... You know, when do you go from the overall structure is telling you this must be a such and such to the, the thing itself is more abstracted and can represent that kind of idea? Um, there's a question from Ethan about a bit of, bit of personal history. In, in version one of Wolfram Language and Mathematica, um, what parts did I actually write the code for myself? Um, and uh, what was the whole distribution of, of things people worked on? Um, you know, I wrote a bunch, well, for example, I wrote the pattern matcher, and I was sort of horrified that some of the code that I wrote in there was still alive and well today. It was complicated code. 
mean, it was a, a um, uh, and what was interesting about that code was that, you know, this idea of kind of pattern matching as a core aspect of a language was something that I'd done a little bit of in SMP, and here it was even more core than it had been in SMP, or at least, uh, um, and the, the question kind of was, um, in, um, in uh, um, you know, you wanted, there was this very principled idea about you could make a transformation rule for these expressions that have these sort of wildcard pieces in them, these so-called blanks in them. Um, the, the question was, if you do that in practice, how do you make that efficient? And what I ended up doing was breaking it into 50, 100 cases. And, you know, it sort of pre-compiles the pattern into all these different cases where it can very efficiently know, oh, I just have to enumerate these different possibilities to see whether it matches and so on. And the what was sort of interesting about that process of programming was it was very high judgment programming. So it's something where, well, what cases do we need? You know, I could have said, in principle, let me just write a program that does all this stuff. Well, it would have been horribly, horribly slow because in practice, I had to make all these judgment calls. Oh, I'll make that a 16-bit bit field because that's enough to, to take, because we won't have cases which are bigger than that and so on. And I actually felt a bit proud of myself because a whole bunch of those decisions that I made have held up remarkably well over the course of more than three decades of, you know, uh, just how, what are the heuristics that you need to use to do this or that thing? And it, it might not have been that way. It might have been the case that things would be, oh, the evaluator also, I wrote the original evaluator. Um, and, uh, you know, it might have been the case that things there were, um, um, uh, were kind of, um, um, uh, you know, the, the heuristic choices I had to make would turn out, yeah, it was okay insofar as I could foresee what would happen in the next six months, but it would break years later. And, and, and I don't think it has, which is, which is really nice to see. And, you know, there were a bunch of ideas. For example, I had this one of my weird ideas was collisionless hash codes, where you don't have to worry about um, where you basically are changing the algorithm for the hash at the time when you create the hashes. So you don't have to worry about collisions. That was one little nifty thing that I put in that again, might have been horrible failure, but actually worked well. And later on, some sort of computer science methods got invented that I, I'm sure we still use collisionless hashes, but they may work in a slightly different way than the way that I developed them. Um, but uh, so I wrote a lot of the kind of um, the core sort of language part of the system. Um, other people wrote uh, pieces of um, uh, the more kind of um, mathematics, algebraic parts of the system. Um, and uh, uh, things like, well, the, 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 the notebook front end that got started in 1987, that was a Teo Gray production. Um, we managed to pull Teo away from being a chemistry graduate student to work on um, uh, the notebook front end. And um, uh, of course, Teo in subsequent years has, has reverted back to some of his chemistry roots by becoming the creator of the, I think, by far most widely used uh, pictorial version of the periodic table and so on. So that's been a, been a nice thing to see. But um, there were a lot of different, different pieces. There were a lot of, some things we were using kind of standard algorithms, some things like a lot of the language stuff, we just had to invent everything from scratch. Um, a big piece of what I did was to write the documentation and I kind of developed the principle of first you document, then you implement, so to speak you write the specification first. There's a chap um, uh, called Jerry Kuiper who um, was involved in something which was a very bold effort to sort of implement um, possible, uh, sort of a very wide range of possible mathematical functions. You know, kind of I'd had the experience I really wanted from SMP. I knew that mathematical special functions were things people really wanted. And it had been sort of a big bunch of work to do each individual function in SMP. And I kind of, for, for Mathematica, I wanted to have kind of a bulk machine for just churning out uh, ways of computing special functions. And I had talked to a bunch of experts in special functions. And I think my, my favorite comment was, um, this was probably 1987 or so, from somebody saying, well, we'll you know, you're crazy to want to do arbitrary precision special functions, hundreds of them, you know, anywhere in the complex plane. You know, our plan is that at the end of the 1990s, we will have implemented uh, quadruple precision Bessel functions. And, and Jerry Kuiper was much involved in um, the, the building the sort of machine of having 
what would what would now be a machine learning story. Um, then we were not using neural nets, we were using simpler kinds of sort of things we could learn from and where we would bash away for a month trying to optimize the parameters of this approximation to some particular kind of function. Um, so that was a, another person who was, um, uh, sadly, Jerry died in a bicycle accident in the um, uh, early 90s. Uh, interesting, interesting person. Let's see who else who's um, still around. Uh, Roman Mader, who's still um, uh, working on Wolfram language. Um, he worked on a bunch of polynomial uh, manipulation code. I think probably polynomial factoring and things like this uh, was his early uh, effort. And he's also a, um, a kind of theory of computation, theory of programming languages person, and uh, was involved in some of, the, um, some of the thinking about those kinds of things. It's been very satisfying how little of what was in version one was just an outright, that was a bad idea, throw it away. I mean, we've really been able to build this design. You know, it helped a lot that I had done SMP first, where I had gotten to experiment with some of the wilder designs and figure out what worked and what didn't. But, you know, if we look back at, at uh, Wolfram Language and Mathematica in the early days, there were lots of decisions that could have been made a different way. For example, the decision to make the computational kernel separate from the user interface front end. That was, you know, client server architecture, et cetera, but those weren't words that existed at that time. That was a decision that we made that was a really good decision that, um, uh, in fact, at the time we sort of separated the software, although, for example, on something like the Macintosh early on, we couldn't separate it in actual implementation. We had two separate code bases and they talked to each other through sort of a thin pipe, but you actually had to compile the two things together on some machines. But it was very nice that right from the very beginning, it was possible to use a remote kernel. And so a very common configuration was you would have your, your user interface running on a Mac and your computational kernel running on some big sort of mini computer like thing and, and off connected through, through some phone line or through some local area network. So that was a, an architectural decision that was very good from the beginning. Um, you know, there were other much more minor things like how are we gonna represent colors? At the time, everybody said colors, they have color maps. You just load up a color map, it's got 256 colors. You're specifying what the precise you know, color values for each of those colors is. But I was like, no, let's not do that. The much more principled thing to do is just, we have an arbitrary RGB color and it's represented with, with three real numbers and so on. And um, if we need to output it on a device that has uh, you know, a, a limited color palette, then we'll find a way to do that. And um, so that was another kind of good decision sort of building for the future. I do remember that we ran into some trouble with that on some, um, I think Windows machines. And I've, I've used that as a kind of a joke ever since. The, um, uh, eventually you, you were setting up all these, all these graphics pieces and they were described as brushes in the operating system, I guess from paint brushes in an early sort of paint system. And so some one of the more, more bizarre messages that you could get was a, the system has run out of brushes. And you kind of wonder, you know, you think about that as a, as a sort of a skeuomorphic design kind of thing of thinking about these, you know, what is it brushing? It's just a, a very bizarre idea and a, and a kind of bizarre word and one that I've kind of used a little bit as a joke ever since in terms of, of weird things that happen in kind of layers below the system we're dealing with. Um, there's a question here. Um, uh, let's see. The um, um, there's a question here about um, how did we develop code at the time, given that there was no CVS and Git and so on. Um, that is a really good question. We had a source code repository, and how did it work? I'm not sure we weren't using things like RCS, the patching system. Um, we even had a source code repository for SMP. And it's a good question. I think people could do checkouts and check-ins and so on. Um, yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, you could do diffs. There was already a diff utility in Unix. Um, but how did that all work? I actually don't remember. Um, I do remember. In SMP, I had the bright idea that um, for added security, we would encrypt the source code. And needless to say, we lost the key. And finally, SMP was, uh, uh, was decoded. The source code was recovered 
um, by a young chap um, who actually works for us now, um, who uh, uh, managed to actually break, I, I, I'd done another crazy thing. I'd said, let's not use the standard Unix crypt program to do the encryption because if in the world of the future, people break these encryption programs, the first ones they'll break are the standard ones like the Unix crypt program. So I said, let's make a modified version of the Unix crypt program. So I did that. And uh, we actually had the encrypted code of the modified crypt program, but we didn't know how it had been modified. And it turns out that the person who ended up breaking this in the end was able to do an interesting approach to breaking this encryption that actually never required knowing the key. It was a way of, of breaking that kind of uh, enigma-like cipher without ever knowing the key. Um, so I don't even know what was that password that we, uh, we probably could deduce it now. What was the password that we managed to forget? Um, it's not easy to run SMP. It has to be run in a virtual machine that's emulating of this, that's emulating of that. Perhaps in the project that we're doing now with, with Wolfram Language to build virtual machines that can emulate, uh, I think we've got an emulator of PDP ones and things like that. Um, eventually we'll get up to the point where we can emulate the machines that could run SMP and then we'll be able to have a, an external evaluator of SMP probably um, in Wolfram Language, which would be kind of fun. Um, but I'm, I'm actually really wondering now, and I'm, I'm just embarrassed that I don't remember the, um, uh, the details of how, how the early code got, got checked into a repository. And, um, um, uh, you know, we had original version one of, so SMP was developed on a VAX 11780 computer where everybody was connected with terminals that were just terminals that had, you know, RS-232 wires going into um, uh, the main machine. Actually, I, I used to, I, I'm, I've been a, a work at home operative for just a ridiculously long time. And even back then in, in 1980 and so on, I used to mostly sort of work from home. But in those days, what, what, what I did was I connected a phone line with an acoustic coupler to, um, to my terminal, to the, to the computer at the office, so to speak. And one of the things that I was, was just amazed by was I would leave this, um, uh, I would just leave this thing connected. You know, local phone calls were free. I figured I'd just leave the thing connected. And um, uh, the um, uh, and I left it connected for months and there wasn't a single piece of noise on the line. It was just like, I just left it connected. I was, guess I was kind of lazy. Um, and uh, uh, I, could, I could just use the, the computer from there. Um, I have to say, I'm, I'm reminded here of a little micro, micro footnote to, to everything. The person who was the um, uh, assistant, the secretary in those in those days, it was called to Dick Feynman and Murray Gellman, was an a interesting woman named Helen Tuck, um, who uh, uh, had um, was a was a um, uh, a kind of a, um, a a spirited person, let's say, um, and um, she was sort of the the departmental. Uh, secretary, assistant for the theoretical physics group, but particularly for those those two kind of luminaries in the group. And before she'd, she'd done that job for many, many years, but before she'd done that job, she'd worked for the phone company. And um, uh, at some time or another, I mentioned to her this thing that, I, you know, I had this thing connected to my thing at home. And she was like, you shouldn't do that. It's going to send a trouble signal to the exchange. And it's, you know, and she gave me this whole long speech about, about how it was, uh, you know, it was cruelty to the phone company to do that. I figured if they really had a problem, they would contact me and, and that never happened. So I didn't worry too much about it. But um, I, I think Helen Tuck also had the, um, uh, uh, she was a, interested spirited person but but um she uh uh she would tell me from time to time uh uh she, she had this little office in between the big office of of, of dick Feynman and, and, and murray gelman and um uh you know sometimes i would be wandering around she'd say she'd sort of say to me um oh he's in his office dick Feynman being the person and you know he's working on hieroglyphs again go talk to him it's like because he would uh Dick Feynman would sometimes, uh, you know, if, if, if there wasn't physics being fed to him or he wasn't interested in any particular area of physics, he liked doing things like trying to decode Mayan hieroglyphs and so on. And, and Helen Tuck thought this was a, a waste of his talents. And it's like, go talk to him, go, go to getting excited about some kind of physics or something. Um, I think uh, another, another Helen Tuck story, I suppose, that was, uh, she used to, 
type papers. Um, it was in the days before physicists knew how to type. I knew how to type, but most physicists didn't. But I still hand wrote out my papers with multiple layers of, um, of uh, uh, white out and labels to make corrections and so on. And then I would, you know, the, the thing was you give them to Helen and she would type them. Um, and uh, uh, I had this paper where um, I had a bunch of calculations that were done actually by sort of computer algebra kinds of techniques. And this paper was full of numbers. It was full of numbers like nine. And uh, there's this whole paper, Helen types this whole thing and every nine she turned into a G. And I was like, wait a minute, why did you do that? And she says, no paper ever has nines in it. Nobody has actual, you know, explicit numbers like that all over these papers. And of course, the reason was because nobody used computers to do algebraic computation. And so nobody was generating weird, you know, pi to the ninth over 399 type things. And so, uh, you know, it was the correct kind of machine learning type assumption that, uh, you know, kind of the any anything that looks a bit like a G is probably a G in those in those papers. So that was a um, uh, those were the days when the way that you typed a paper like that was using an IBM Selectric typewriter, where and this was sort of I think the origin of some of these uh, character sets we talked about earlier. They would have these golf balls that would be so that the the typewriter would. Uh, um, would have a, sort of an electrical typewriter, and it would it would have these characters on this kind of as as embossed things on a on a, this sort of golf ball shaped object. And when you wanted to type a particular letter, the golf ball would rotate around so that that letter would be aligned with where it would where when you hit the golf ball to the to the ribbon to the to the paper, that would be the character that got typed. And so what you would do when you wanted to type a lambda or something is you would go and you would pull out the golf ball that had the ordinary English characters on it. You would put in the, lamp, the golf ball with Greek and then there was a mapping from the, the keys on the standard keyboard to the keys on the, um, uh, um, uh, on the, on the, um, uh, the, 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 to the things on the golf ball so that, you know, an L corresponded to a lambda and so on. Um, the, uh, um, it's um, uh, let's see. Somebody is commenting that that Helen Tuck almost discovered Benford's law that um, numbers, on average, you know, most numbers at least start more often with ones than with with nines. That that law was discovered a hundred years earlier from um, uh, from things. Well, let's see. All right. Um, I think we need to wrap up here. Um, Ethan is commenting. No wonder the. Um, but the pattern matcher is still so slow. It was code that I wrote that long ago. Yeah, well, I've been pushing for um, for that code to get rewritten and actually with our new compilation technology. Um, I think um, uh, um, I think that will finally happen in a really nice way. Um, all right, well, thanks for, thanks for joining us here and um, to be continued another time. And I think um, next week, is the first anniversary of the launch of our physics project. And so next week at this time, I'll uh, be trying to give a little bit of a summary of where we've come over the past year and a little bit of where we think we're going um, in, the, in the time to come. So uh, thanks for joining us and uh, 